Good evening, everyone. My name is Mike DiBiase. Uh, welcome to our second body track webinar. Uh, we are going to be doing these hopefully monthly for you. Um, we really appreciate everybody that's attending to this. This will be kept to about an hour. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to type them in the question box, and I'll be glad to answer them as, as they pop up. And at the end, I'll leave some time for a little Q&A. Also, if you have questions that I am unable to answer today, I'll definitely be taking them, um, answering them, and then I will be giving them back to BodyTrack to post so you all will have answers to all the questions asked. Um, so again, my name is Mike DiBiase. I'm a registered dietitian, also a personal trainer and strength conditioning specialist. Um, I like to do this kind of in my spare time, and I really do hope you all get something out of this. Today we are going to be talking about which diet is the best diet. I think some of you may be, um, you know, you think you'll be pretty excited to see some of the research that is coming out on these diets um, and trends which have hit in the late 2000s on some of them. Some of them have been around since the 90s and if not even later. Um, so let's get started. We're going to start off by actually defining what is dieting. So most people, when they think of dieting, they automatically think of, of a negative. Um, so when you Google search the question, what is dieting, this is exactly what you get. This will be one of your first hits. Uh, restrict oneself to small amounts or special kinds of food in order to lose weight. Um, or lose weight, watch one's weight, reduce, slenderize. And that is rather misleading. That is, you know, automatically the assumption that the word diet means to lose something, and really the truth is we all diet. Every single one of us, uh, depending on what we eat, how we eat, when we eat, that is our own personal diet. So when we automatically assume the word diet is to lose or to reduce, uh, that's technically not true, but for the sake of this talk, we are going to be talking about the term diet and the reduction of weight and or fat mass or change to body composition as that relates to the word diet. So uh, again, diet can be I'm on a diet to increase muscle mass, I'm on a diet to lose fat mass, I'm on a diet to drop weight or, change or reduce comorbidities. Um, so diet is just really how, when, what, and why we are eating. But for this talk, we are going to be talking about reduction. So why we diet. Uh, there's a 2011 Gallup poll, and it was titled, To Lose Weight, Americans Rely More on Dieting Than Exercise, which really doesn't surprise us because dieting can be relatively easier. It's changing something, changing something you eat, which is rel relatively easy, um, reducing something you eat compared to having to potentially purchase a gym membership go drive to a gym, work out, and some people it's very, very difficult to get the motivation to work out where sometimes it's easier just to change what, what you eat. So the convenience of dieting definitely plays in, in a role in a lot of people. Um, in the title, the response to the Gallup poll was, Americans who have succeeded at losing weight at some point in their lives, uh, which is about 52% of all U.S. adults, are more likely to mention various dietary changes than efforts at exercising at the, as the most effective strategies to drop pounds. Um, that, again, is no surprise. It's relatively easy just to change something you eat and to also have to exercise. That can be very difficult for a lot of people. This was the part of the Gallup poll that showed in response, and if you tally up all these responses in the percentage cat, uh, column, you'll actually see that it's more than 100%, which is... Um, which is true because most people actually responded with multiple answers. Some people responded that they worked out and ate less, um, so their response would have counted uh, multiple times, uh, took diet pills or pregnancy, so some people had multiple answers for this, so it's no surprise that it's over 100%. But as you can see, the most effective strategies were exercise, number one, at 31%, where they saw weight loss, and people who ate less non-specific dieting, just pretty much ate less, 23%. So if you're looking at the two top ways 
to essentially lose weight, it would probably seem fair to say, well, if one of them works at me losing weight, why not try both of them if I want to lose weight? And clearly that is the answer. It is exercise and dietary changes um, under consumption of calories that helps us lose the most weight and the, at the fastest rate usually. I just want to give this real quick. Uh, obesity and overweight in America, there's always been some numbers that have been floating around, but these are the numbers that have come out of the National Institute of Health and the CDC over the last few years. Um, obesity, which we consider a BMI of 30 or greater, and adults 20 and older, more than one-third, 35.7% of adults are considered to be obese, and that's from National Institute of Health. And the Journal of American Medicine puts it pretty close at 34.9. So you're looking at about 35% of the American U.S. adult population are obese with a BMI of 30 or greater. That's a staggering number, considering that's jumped up um, in factors in the last few decades. Um, Obesity-related conditions, heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, certain types of cancer, and um, some of the leading causes of preventable death. Estimated annual medical cost of obesity in 2008 was $147 billion. That is a staggering number. Uh, most of us can't really comprehend. So, And the medical cost for people who are obese, on average, were almost $1,500 higher. Um, you know, for us who are doing the best to try to save money, make money for us in the future, for our children, and for us to actually use whenever we retire, um, if we want to consider, you know, can constantly use up all our money to feed ourselves and become obese, well, you know, my, my theory is stay fit now, stay active, and use that money when you're older and have your fun then. Don't be wasting it on trying to cure something you could, we could be doing every day now. So why do we diet? It really it comes down to a multitude of things and everybody has a different answer. Improved health. A lot of us want to be healthier, to live longer, to be able to do things um, that we really couldn't do maybe when we were younger and, con and consistently do now as we get older. Um, look and feel better. A lot of us diet, so we have that aesthetic look to us that we've been looking for, and just overall feel better, feel like we're accomplishing something. Um, you know, to be considered more normal, and this also goes with the next one, the pressures from media, social stigma, and peer pressure to look or be a certain way, where maybe our views of what normal are are really normal. You know, the media, um, the stigmas of being socially accepted by our peers and our friends and even family members um, can be daunting on us sometimes to have to be a certain way and be considered normal. And if we're not normal, then we must be abnormal, um, which, which of course is not true. Um, but that's why some people do diet. Uh, the body composition change, changing, reducing fat mass, increasing lean body mass to get that look that we want, um, which could potentially lead to enhanced performance. Not always, but some people die, especially athletes, to enhance their performance. Tour de France uh, bike riders drop their weights heavily so they can actually pedal faster and be lighter on the bike. Uh, wrestlers diet, sometimes daily, sometimes for long terms. Boxers, so they can maintain to be in certain weight classes, so they may have an edge on somebody. Increase longevity, be able to live a little bit longer, uh, depending on that diet, of course. And, of course, many other reasons, financial reasons, spiritual, economical, environmental reasons. You know, we diet because we don't have the money, maybe, to afford other food, and we're just on a forced diet. Uh, spiritual, you know, a lot of us may have religious convictions that force us to have to diet a certain way or eat only certain foods and stay away from certain foods. Uh, economical, you know, being in certain areas, uh, lower SES, higher affluence, depending on where you are. Environmental reasons, you know, a lot of us and certain people don't have access to, you know, large uh, grocery stores, and they may not be close enough to get certain foods. So there's a lot of people out there that are essentially grocery shopping at convenience stores and pharmacies like CVS and Rite Aid, and a lot of those places don't have the essential foods that a lot of us um, kind of take for granted. So many reasons why we diet. 
And there's so many choices of different quote-unquote diets out there. This list could be pages and pages long. We are only going to talk today about four of them, and these four tend to be the ones that a lot of people have been using lately. Um, paleo versus paleo for sports and athletes, there is a large difference. We are not going to be talking about paleo for sports and athletes today. Uh, we are just going to be talking about the paleo diet. That will be for another time to talk about the sports and athletes one. But understand there is a large difference. Some of you may just think paleo is paleo. That is incorrect. Paleo versus paleo for sports and athletes it are two completely separate um, diet plans, and we will go over the latter one at another time. Low carb, um, we'll be talking about Atkins diet. I'm sure many of you have heard about it. Maybe some of you have even tried it before. Uh, Gluten-free, which is always a big popular one. And the latest one that a lot of younger people, especially college students and young professionals have been doing is called the IIFYM, the If It Fits Your Macros diet. And some of you may be surprised that you actually may be doing this already. And just to preface that I accept no specific diet, I don't think one is worse than any other, and we're going to go over to these scientifically and explain exactly how these diet plans work in your body, how they affect you, the pros and the cons, and let you come to your own professional decision as to what you think is better and what could potentially be better for you, depending on your goals, your health status, your level, so forth. So we're going to start off the paleo diet. Um, I put in some, at least I think they're funny pictures. Uh, the paleo diet, so easy a caveman can do it, clearly. And the paleo pyramid. This, of course, is not the exact designated pyramid. There's so many different quote-unquote pyramids and different diagrams and infographics of diet plans, but I thought this was pretty sufficient just to describe what the paleo diet looks like. And really, what the paleo diet is, again, not to be confused for paleo for athletes, it's a low-carb diet that restricts a lot of today's food choices. And if you look at the right-hand column area, you'll see that essentially the okay-to-eat foods in the paleo diet are fruits, vegetables, lean meats, seafood, nuts and seeds, and healthy fats. Healthy fats coming from, you know, potentially pressed nuts, avocados, um, different flour oils, those kind of things. Avoid dairy, grains, processed foods and processed sugars and refined foods and refined sugars. Legumes, and legumes are, again, like beans and lentils and those kind of things. Starches, like breads, potatoes, corn, and alcohol. Um, the paleo diet essentially just originated from the idea that if, you, if our caveman ancestors, who were hunter-gatherers, if they were eating a certain way and they were living a certain way and they were working a certain way, then we should be eating just like them. The fact that they could only get those certain foods, those meats, those vegetables and fruits and nuts and seeds and the fats from the plants and animals that they were eating, um, that's how they survive. So why have we gone to a refined, processed food meal plan where the, mo the majority of the food that we eat could be potentially processed and, quote, unquote, not real foods? Um, you know, the paleo diet is, has been around for, if, if this is their theory, has been around for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, but really it's come to fruition in the last few years, which I'll show you on my next slide as to why. Um, the paleo, it can make it very hard for some people to enjoy eating. A lot of us really do enjoy having those carbohydrates from grains and starches and, you know, having a beer every now and then. And so to avoid that, it can be very detrimental for some people mentally and physically. The, their claim is that you will lead a better, healthier, more fit life with lower risk of disease, which unfortunately there is very little research on that claim. Um, but that is the claim of people who follow the paleo diet and advocates for it. Uh, highly processed, carb-heavy eating patterns have been um, some of the biggest contributors to health crises today, increased obesity, increased uh, morbidities in certain disease, and um, especially with younger children now getting 
type 2 diabetes when they weren't getting it 20 plus years ago. A lot of people are claiming that it's these refined processed foods that we're eating um, for decades and generations of people that are causing some of these. And so their theory is go back to what we originally ate, back to the caveman, our, pre, our ancestors of hunter-gatherers. This is taken from Brian St. Pierre, and he did a talk for Precision Nutrition. He is a registered dietitian as well. But here is the difference between Paleolithic eating and today eating. You know, fruits were different. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the apple is not an American fruit. It came from the Middle East area, and it's been brought over and cultivated. And so, again, it's not from this area, but it's still very nutrient-dense. So, again, fruits were different in certain areas. Uh, fruits were proliferating in certain areas and then brought over from certain areas, which also led to fruits and produce being selectively bred for those specific areas and those specific needs and tastes. And that breeding could potentially lead to certain nutrients or certain DNA being changed in that food um, and certain changes that could potentially have an effect on us, on us humans, something that you know I personally don't know or we can even look at. We just don't know what people ate thousands and thousands of years ago and how that really affected them. Uh, thousands of cultivars created. The wild game as Paleolithic. Now we've domesticated a lot of the food that we eat and processed the food that they are eating. We find certain foods they are eating um, to make it cheaper, which has led to a lot of documentaries that you can definitely view on your own to show uh, just the type of food that we are domesticating and the food that that food is eating. Um, really, the, f the, the bottom line is the foods are not the same from our ancestors to what they are now. And the paleo diet really has come into play heavily because of CrossFit. Uh, for those of you who have ever seen Fight Club, the movie, first rule of CrossFit is tell everyone about CrossFit. Of course, CrossFit's not really in Fight Club, but I thought this was pretty hilarious because we all know somebody who does CrossFit, and they make us know that they do it. Um, but the paleo diet has really spawned heavily through the CrossFit community. And in all honesty, the CrossFit community does definitely one thing great. They are great at creating a culture. And that culture follows this diet, the, the very, very strict ones, um, and very, very strictly. And so because of CrossFit, the paleo diet has gotten a lot of attention as to body composition changes. Um, for some people, performance changes and performance enhancement as well. Now, the thing about CrossFit and the paleo diet is can be a little misleading. And if you've ever listened to some of the other talks or come to some of the other lectures, if you ever know anything about CrossFit, it is a high-energy, high-intensity workout which essentially pushes that person's body in a relatively short amount of time to its metabolic limits. It's you're essentially going as heavy as possible with the shortest rest time as possible, high endurance, and the highest reps possible for whatever that set of that workout is. And that is an extreme workout. For if you've ever, if any of you have ever done it, it's and to succinctly put it, it's, a, it's extreme. It's everything. It's high intensity, high volume. It could be high duration. It could be high endurance. So that takes a toll on our energy systems. And to be able to produce that much energy to continue with that workout becomes difficult. So in the previous lecture, we talked about carbohydrates. And carbs are the easiest of the three macronutrients to process for energy. And the energy we use is ATP. It also gives the fastest rate of ATP production. So when we consume carbohydrates, we're able to get that ATP production relatively quickly. And we utilize, when we start a, usually a workout, we usually start off with the creatine phosphate, and then it moves into the breakdown of glucose, carbohydrate. So with the paleo diet, we are limiting carbohydrate intake. No grains, no alcohol, no legumes, no processed breads and sugars. So if we're limiting these quick energy morsels, this ability to get this quick energy, where are we going to get this quick energy co to come from? And if you were somebody who was working out this hard, you would think consuming carbohydrates um, would help 
with such a high demand for the energy and you think this would be a good idea just beca because if your body is demanding, I need more fuel now, though the carbohydrate is going to give you that more fuel now. So why are the people who are doing these high energy, high intense, high volume workouts restricting one of the most essential macronutrients? Um, that's just something that's been going on. And a lot of it has to do with body composition change. So anecdotally, you know, some people have, have claimed to have more energy. And that can be attributed to many things. It could be attributed to you know, quote unquote cleaner eating, not eating the processed refined foods and having a sense of moral purpose to eat more whole foods. Um, more nutrient uh, dense food choices, having those foods that are heavy in minerals and vitamins and not necessarily higher in calories to actually fortify our body uh, microscopically to the cellular level and be able to produce that energy that we need over long periods of time. It can also be the placebo effect. When we say, hey, we're starting a new diet, we'll get very excited about it, and that positive mood change, which is the next one, that mood enhancement, could lead to better effects, better performance in the gym and other daily activities, you know, act um, activities of daily living. And also better dispersion of calories throughout the day. You know, we tend to try to get on a specific diet and we try to eat better uh, we tend to also disperse those calories more evenly throughout the day, which could, for a lot of us, change our metabolic rate, um, could enhance lean body mass for us, could be changing that body composition, may have, may have the placebo effect on performance, and all of that just kind of compounds and says, we are doing better, we look better, we perform better, and that just leads to better outcomes. So it could be a multitude of things. It could be one of those things. It could be none of those things. Um, the paleo diet, again, may or may not be beneficial for performance, but it may, and especially with CrossFit, but it may be better for aesthetics and the body composition changes. Now, just because we change body composition, and body composition, composition meaning increase lean mass, decrease fat mass, that doesn't necessarily mean that we will perform better. Just because we have more muscle and less fat, if we weigh less, we may not be able to lift as much or lift as heavy as we wanted to, or we may not be able to go nearly as long. So body composition changes don't necessarily reflect performance enhancement, and performance enhancement doesn't necessarily reflect body composition changes. So for some people, the paleo diet style for CrossFit and these high-intensity workouts work, and for others, they don't. And again, it really just comes down to trial and error. It's individualized. More studies have to be done on this type of diet and these type of workouts. Here's a sample meal plan of a, of a paleo diet, and this comes from U.S. News Health. Uh, you can see breakfast, half a cantaloupe, 12-ounce broiled Atlantic salmon. I don't know anybody who would eat salmon that early in the morning, but this is a paleo-style diet where it's lean meats throughout the day, fresh fruits, vegetables, nuts. Um, for a lot of us, half a cantaloupe and a 12-ounce broiled Atlantic salmon, no matter what time of day, that's just not a lot for us. So looking at this, this is based off a of 2,200 calorie. If we're expelling more, if our total daily energy expenditure is above that, we can see weight loss. If it's under that, we can probably see weight gain. So it really depends on what our goals are, how hungry we are, and if this is something that is sustainable for each of us. Uh, a lot of us can do this temporarily, but some of us may revert back to eating carbohydrates because we crave them so much. Our body craves them because our brain functions on carbohydrates. Our brain functions on glucose. And when we don't get that glucose that we need, our body screams out for those nutrients that we want. Sometimes we revert back to eating those things and the diet is broken. But here's an example of one that you can see and kind of get an idea of just how little um, refined, just how few or no refined uh, carbohydrates there are and just how little of grains there are. So the paleo diet, kind of in, in an essence, what the diet gets right. It creates an emphasis on lean proteins, which we are always trying to tell people to eat more of. More protein leads sustainability of muscle mass, helps increase muscle protein synthesis, also helps with enzymes, metabolic processes. 
whole fruits and vegetables. Of course, we want to get to see people eat more of these nutrient-dense foods, lower calorie, more nutrient-dense foods, raw edible nuts and seeds, and healthy fats. It actually can be more satiating uh, due to the higher protein and fat consumption. Protein and fat, when we consume either of them, we actually feel fuller because they take up a little bit more space um, because we can actually sometimes, you know, just because of the size of sometimes the food that we eat. Also, the fact that it takes longer to break a protein and a fat down than it does to break down a carbohydrate, that keeps us feeling fuller longer. So just that being feeling of knowing that we ate enough and we don't need to eat again can actually lead to weight loss for a lot of people. And that's also with the reduction in carbohydrates and or calorie consumption. It could be both. It could be one or the other. Potentially effective. And again, this is potentially more studies need to be done. There's been a few. I can count them on my hand. And they've been short-term studies within a matter of days. Um, I don't think anything I've seen longer than just a few weeks. Um, but it could be potentially effective for reducing onset of certain diseases, reduced insulin secretion, increased insulin sensitivity, which is good because we want to see uh, every time we eat a carbohydrate and increase glucose in our blood, uh, we want that insulin to respond quickly to bring it back to normal level, levels. Um, reduced LDL, which is the quote-unquote bad cholesterol, so we can reduce the bad cholesterol, and decrease blood pressure. And so for a lot of people who have higher blood pressure and their cholesterol is uh, on the higher side, the paleo diet potentially may be a slightly effective way to reduce these things for them. And the increased awareness of food production, a lot of paleo Advocates have spent a lot of time researching where their food comes from, get a better idea of moral and ethical issues of how food's processed and where they're processed, um, and the reduced nutrient densities of how, and the reduced nutrient dense of how some of our foods are. And they get a better awareness of, okay, what is more nutrient dense and what is more nutrient weak. And these people are able to see that these type of foods are more nutrient dense and they gravitate towards those. What the paleo diet gets wrong, their basis for excluding dairy, legumes, and grains is weak. More, there's more research out there to show that dairy has tremendous um, positive effects on muscle growth, muscular development, skeletal development and growth. Uh, legumes are high in protein, can be higher in carbohydrates, but also contain fiber which some of these diets lack unless you take a soluble fiber and insoluble fiber supplement. And whole grains have been shown, again, with higher fiber and also contain a lot of minerals and vitamins that some of these diets just don't produce. Uh, potentially miss and have insufficient levels of fiber, uh, K, which is potassium, CA, which is calcium, and vitamins B12 and D. We need fiber for um, just the mobility of certain nutrients, and we need potassium for essentially the balance of sodium in the cells, and also you know for the conversion of certain energies. Calcium heavily fortified in bone. The more calcium we're able to consume and actually keep proper levels of calcium, we actually don't utilize the calcium in the bone then. And this is why a lot of we see a lot more osteoporosis in women because women tend to eat and consume lower levels of calcium than men because women actually tend to consume a little bit less dairy than men. Um, these are some things that we have to be conscientious about because the older we get, especially older women, have higher rates and higher incidences of bone fractures and um, osteoporotic events where we want to see them eat and consume more calcium. In vitamin B12, B vitamin, energy conversion of carbs, proteins, and fats. So B12 is necessary for those metabolic processes. And vitamin D, if we're not getting outside enough, vitamin D helps the absorption of calcium um, back into the muscles and into the bones. And vitamin D is also a precursor of cholesterol, which we all need. Um, also gets wrong, there's no long-term studies performed to see any change in disease morbidity, weight loss, maintenance, or long-term effects on health. 
again, a lot of these studies were done just over a few days to show uh, very quick observational research. And we need more long-term studies to say this diet does this well, this diet does, does this not well. Um, the evolutionary argument that the caveman diet is the best and, and cavemen and our hunter-gatherers lived healthy lives has very little merit. But we don't know enough about them. We don't know enough about how well they lived or how long um, or just their any disease morbidity. So to say that that's the best diet, again, very little merit and basis for it. The strict food rules and lists that can reduce uh, margin of error, consistently saying taking this away from somebody's diet and taking this and then taking this, that reduces the margin of error for a lot of people to say, okay, now I can only have these certain foods, and if I teeter left or right too far, I lose my balance and I will be off the diet. And then some have to start over, and it's daunting mentally and physically for some people. So those stricter food rules create stricter boundaries for those people that for some it's very, very difficult to maintain. And for some people it can be definitely more expensive. We can go to any store and see uh, lean meats are way more expensive, uh, sometimes up to seven, eight, ten, twelve dollars a pound. And if we're going to spend that and we have to feed our family, we have to buy it again eventually and then buy it again. And where we can spend all that money sometimes on other foods, like grains and dairy, which aren't maybe as expensive, and it'll last longer. So for some people, these things can be very expensive to maintain these diets, and uh, especially people with restricted access who live so many miles away from a large grocery store, uh, less affluent areas, lower socioeconomic statuses. This becomes very difficult for them, and a lot of them revert away from these diets. So that's pretty much the sum of the paleo diet. <clears throat> um, Again, you know, if, if you have questions, I'll be glad to answer them. We're going to get right into the next one, <clears throat> the Atkins diet. And I'm sure we've all heard of this. This diet has been around for a long, long time. And you're going to see a lot of similarities between the Atkins diet and paleo diet. A lot of these diets share gross similarities and very fine adjustments to themselves to kind of distinguish themselves as a separate diet. But the Atkins diet in itself is a low-carb diet, just like paleo diet is. It is a low-carb diet. Now, the difference essentially between paleo and Atkins is paleo isn't as low as Atkins can get. Um, the aim of the diet, again, is weight maintenance or weight loss for Atkins. And their claim is, you know, quote, lose 15 pounds within two weeks. But unfortunately, we don't know what those pounds are. Those pounds, if you're exercising, could be more water and fat mass and maybe a little lean mass. But if you're not exercising, that water could be more lean mass, essentially muscle, some fat mass and water. So we always want to exercise, strength training, cardio, core, those kind of things. We always want to do these when we're doing these, if we're doing these diets, because we want to preserve lean mass. When we lose weight, that is not to make the assumption that it's strictly just fat is a fallacy. It could also be lean muscle tissue we're losing. It could be water. It could be fat mass. It could be a combination of all three. So when we incorporate exercise and resistance training, we preserve that lean mass as best as possible and continue with more fat mass loss and more water loss. The theory behind the Atkins diet is that uh, the carbohydrates, again, are the primary fuel source. Just like I said a few minutes ago, it is what we use primarily. It is the quickest way to get energy into our system th via the three macronutrients, proteins, fats, and carbs. But limiting carb intake to use an alternate fuel source. So their thing is, if we can limit the carbs over a longer period of time, the body will convert to using fat as a fuel source. And if we can use fat, we can actually get more energy because there's four calories per gram in a carbohydrate. But there's nine calories per gram in fat. So we can potentially get, on average, two times as much energy if we can burn fat over carbohydrates. But to burn fat is very difficult. Strictly fat is very difficult. We usually have to work out for a longer period of time 
over a lower threshold, usually around 60 to 70 percent VO2 max, potentially all the way up to an hour to start seeing fat being utilized as a fuel source. Um, so their whole thing is removal of refined sugars, same thing as paleo, simple starches, same thing as paleo, um, an increase in fats and lean proteins, same thing as paleo, and you know fat is burned and pounds are lost. So that's kind of their premise. Your base of your meal plan should be protein sources of lean meats, eggs, cheeses, those kind of things, vegetables, fruits, and as you can see, it gets less and less. Of course, less oils and fats because they are so high in calories per gram, nine calories in fats uh, per gram, four calories per gram in proteins and carbohydrates. So you're going to get more bang for your buck with the fats, so you do want to keep those relatively low. And whole grains. The difference that you can see between Atkins diet and paleo diet is the Atkins diet does still include whole grains and carbohydrates into its meal plan. It does not say never eat them where paleo diet is restricting them as much as possible. But the Atkins diet does start off very, very low, where the paleo diet does, does not. It does say you can have so many amount of carbohydrates, but the Atkins diet, Atkins diet definitely starts off lower, and I'll show you on the next slide. So it's really based off of four phases. Um, you have the induction phase, the ongoing weight loss, which they, can, they call OWL, the pre-maintenance and maintenance. So phase one is the induction phase. And this is where for about two weeks on average, you will keep your carb intake to 20 net carbs. And they call net carbs because you subtract fiber out of it to say, okay, well, if it's three grams of fiber, it's actually three less carbohydrates, which technically is not true, but this is the way this diet is designed. Um, if you look at the graph onto the right and look over where it says Atkins, um, induction in parentheses, it'll say 1,640 calories, which is the average daily calorie, so that's not too bad. Um, but look over in the next three columns, 61, and skip the 19 because that's actually just saturated fat, so 61, 8, and 31. If you follow the 61, that is percent daily calories, and that is coming from fat. So over half of the calories you consume on the Atkins diet are coming from fat alone. That is a very large number. For a lot of us, kind of difficult. Um, carbohydrate, if you look, it's the third column, 8%. And again, that, that number ranges, you know, it could be 8, it could be 10, it could be 12, depending on who that person is. Um, that number, 8%, is extremely low for a lot of us. A lot of us are eating closer to 50 to 60 percent of our calories are coming from carbohydrates and that's saying eight, um, anywhere up to like as 10, maybe even 11. So we're looking at um, five to eight times less carbohydrate intake on the Atkins diet. And protein, 31 percent, which is actually kind of right in the middle of where the RDA kind of says, they usually say around, you know, 15 to 25, some diets you see up to, all the way up to 30 percent, so it's actually in a good range. The phase two, the ongoing weight loss, um, slowly increasing the net carb intake by five grams every week. So after the first two weeks, you'll increase it to 25, and then 30, and then 35, and then 40. And so that also gives you a little bit more freedom on your food choices. The phase three, the pre-maintenance, increasing net carb now intake by 10 grams per week. And here you get to learn and kind of figure out, okay, how many carbs can I consume where I can maintain my workout intensity, my performance, my activities of daily living, and still lose weight without anything negatively functioning. And then your phase four is your maintenance. This is where you are taking in. You know, okay, this is the maximum necessary carbs that I need, whether that's 50 grams or 150 grams, it, it's individualized for everybody, and this is where you know, okay, I can maintain this weight if I consume this many grams of carbs and then split off from proteins and fats, and there's my three macronutrients, and now I can just maintain this once you've found out that, once you've reached that perfect weight. And the Atkins diet does say that if you do feel that you've gained weight or you've lost something, you can always backtrack and go back a phase or two or go back to the beginning and start over. So it always gives you the opportunity to kind of start and refresh yourself. 
here's a sample meal plan if, uh, the, for the phase one if you look on the left and then phase four if you look on the right you'll see grave differences where there's just more food. You can see that there's a larger amount of food on the right than there is on the left. Um, not by much, but more food, more energy, more nutrients to consume. Um, but here's something just for you guys to look at uh, between the phase one, the induction phase, and the phase four, the maintenance phase. So what the Atkins diet gets right. It's been studied actually longer and harder than a lot of these other low-carb diets. There's been many, many studies on it, um, all varying in different answers. For every 10 studies that say it's the best diet, there's 10 studies that say it's, it's not. So it's always refutable, but it's definitely been studied and actually has some merit. Um, it actually appears to have some success with weight loss, especially in the first few weeks, because we know that carbohydrates have a high affinity for water, we do see carbohydrates leads to a lot of water loss. It also makes up the bulk of our calorie intake for a lot of us. So reducing the bulk of that calorie intake puts us in a negative caloric balance, which then leads us to lose weight. Um, there have been a few short studies that have shown an increase in HDL, which is the good cholesterol, lower blood pressure, just like in the paleo diet, but again, have little statistical merit. So there's been a lot of people that have gone through these studies and, and a lot of these scientists say, yeah, this has happened. But statistically, is it good enough to say that it does happen? No. But again, the observation has shown that the increase in good cholesterol and lower blood pressure has been shown in some of these studies. There's, has, there's no indication of deleterious short-term effects. Um, some people have complained of nausea, indigestion, um, cramping, shakes, and that pretty much can be attributed to such a low carbohydrate intake. We a lower blood sugar, we tend to get shaky, tired, uh, low energy levels, and that's where we need those carbohydrates sometimes for that specific energy. Um, and the Atkins diet, you know, when you say you're part of a diet plan, it also gives people a sense of purpose. And there's guidelines that make it a little bit easier for people to follow. What the Atkins diet gets wrong. So in 2010, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans came out, and the fat intake for the DGA is 20 to 35 percent fat intake. The Atkins diet can be almost two times that, two to three times that number. Not saying that that's horrible, not saying that that's great, just saying that the DGA came out in 2010, this is what they recommend the government says they recommend for Americans is 20 to 35 percent, and the Atkins diet is saying we can go up as high as 63 percent and potentially see no effect. So just know we are out way outside the boundaries of the normal recommendations. Um, it does not provide the recommended amount of carbs during any phase. So a lot of these diets will say, okay, you will start off at this amount of carbohydrates. This percentage of your diet will be the Atkins diet does not. So for a lot of people's trial and error just to even start out to say what is the minimum other than the 20 where it says and where is my recommended level to maintain. So for a lot of people they have to kind of backtrack a phase to kind of find out where their number is that they can maintain that weight in phase four. Um, it also can be lacking, again, in essential nutrients, fiber, potassium, calcium, vitamin B12 and D, just like the paleo diet. And a lot of these also come from the dairy that can, that is being sometimes um, refused and, and told not to be consumed, and the grains that contain a lot of these fortified nutrients that they aren't consuming as much of. It can be easy to follow for the short term. A lot of people, again, they get excited about starting a new diet, that mood change, that positive reinforcement about starting something new, starting something good, and it could be great short term, but a lot more and more people are seeing difficulties as the carbs are still continuously low. Increasing five grams of carbs per week to 10 grams of is still not a lot. That's maybe a piece of gum relatively every day. Not a sugar-free gum, just a regular piece of gum increase in carbohydrates. So for a lot of people that's still very, very low where they just can't last that long on such a low carb diet 
and they end up going off the diet just because also exercise sometimes increases. They get very excited about starting a new diet. Exercise increases. They start walking more, working out more, uh, working out longer, training harder, training faster. And so burning more calories, using more energy and more energy that we don't have can be deleterious for a lot of people. The Atkins diet can also be expensive when you're expending a lot of your money on fresh vegetables and fruits and lean meats. Again, same thing with paleo. It could be harder for a lot of, for certain people to get these kind of foods on a daily or weekly basis. And unfortunately, with a lot of these diets, you won't see exercise as part of their diet plan. They won't say, also included with this diet, you should be doing this type of work, or you should consider these diet plans are diet plans. And what we need to realize and what we should all realize now is the best way for weight loss and body composition changes is the combination of a proper healthy diet and proper well-executed exercise. The next diet is gluten-free and I'm sure some of us have tried this or know somebody who's on and I know quite a few people who are on gluten-free. Um, I've tried pretty much every single one of these diets myself and I've seen results from every single one of these diets including the gluten-free one. This type of diet is not a low carb, high carb, high protein. This is a type of what we just considered a balanced diet. And this is mainly used for people who have these conditions which are called celiac disease or just a gluten intolerance. Uh, it's being popularized by a lot of people who feel it's a quote unquote cleaner way of eating, removing some of these refined processed foods that maybe our predecessors never ate. And again, if you look at it, it's the wheat products, the where it says foods to avoid in the chart, wheat, hammer, spelt, kamut, wheat starch, bran, germ, uh, barley, rye, and also oats and malt are on that list. So we call it a worm B. Wheat, oats, rye, malt, and barley are the foods to avoid because of the gluten content in them. And a lot of people avoid these because they think that these foods will cause them to feel worse and you know not be able to eat as clean and feel as good when they eat or when they avoid the wheat, oats, rye, malt, and barley. Just a quick recap on gluten. Gluten is just a protein. It's found in wheat, grain, barley, and derivatives, malt, malt liquors, malt flours, those kind of things. Um, if you've ever mixed wheat or flour with water and it started to get really elastic and tough, you've, you're creating gluten. That's essentially what you're creating. You're creating that protein um, that's found in chewy cookies and breads and those kind of things. Celiac disease is an autoimmune attack on the intestinal lining, uh, which causes gastrointestinal distress um, and also potential malabsorption of some of those essential minerals and nutrients that we consume through the food. So if you've ever known somebody who has celiac and if they've ever accidentally eaten something that has gluten in it, within sometimes 20 minutes, 30 minutes to an hour, um, they could be on the ground rolling in pain because that gluten does not allow, uh, it's an immune attack on their intestinal lining which creates a horrible upset stomach and pain in their uh, midsection which also blocks a lot of those nutrients from being absorbed. And that consistent pain, that consistent attack, and that long-term malabsorption can lead to long-term effects, negative effects for that person. So people with celiac need to be on a gluten-free diet where they can learn to pick and choose the foods that they need, take specific supplements if they need to to make sure they're getting their micro and macronutrients in line, and to not be having this autoimmune attack on them as, uh, you know, as much as possible. It really is a very, very painful thing for people who have celiac to go through. Um, advocates for a gluten-free diet claim the diet can also help alleviate or just ease, and mostly it's just ease, uh, other problems including digestive issues, eczema, which is a skin condition, inflammation and chronic inflammation, uh, ADHD, especially in children, weight gain. Everything is about weight gain with these diets, so eating gluten-free, but if we look at a reduction in these foods, 
the, essentially the common denominator out of these foods is wheat and grain products, which make up a large amount of our diet. So if we're taking a large amount of the greatest percentage of our diet out, we potentially reduce calorie intake, potentially increase nutrient intake, and potentially see weight loss. So it's not that these diets have some special magic number to them. It's the fact that we just may be consuming less foods, which are leading to the weight loss that we want to see. So here's a simple meal plan. Um, fried egg, sautéed veggies, and sweet potato hash. For a lot of people, this is a relatively easy diet if they have celiac or a gluten intolerance and they've been doing this a long time. For people who are new or have just been diagnosed, this can be very problematic because a lot of the foods that we eat have gluten in them. A lot of the foods that are processed or, may, or uh, processed in a plant put on an assembly line. Some of those assembly lines and those plants also have areas where they do things where they also process other foods. And sometimes you'll see on the back of a container process in a facility that also contains blah, blah, blah. You know, if you have a nut allergy, sometimes you'll see that it'll say process in a place that you know, processes nuts and dairy. And sometimes they process in a place that has wheat and gluten. And we have to be, or people that have gluten intolerances and celiac have to be aware that if these foods are contaminated with gluten or processed on the same assembly line or touched or handled with um, the protein on them, they could have an autoimmune attack. So they have to be very, very careful depending on the severity of their attack as well. So what the gluten-free diet gets right it treats the celiac disease and gluten insensitivity. It does not cure it, but it helps alleviate those symptoms. So those people who have those that the disease or the insensitivity and intolerance have to be very mindful and careful of what they eat. Um, as this diet has gotten popular, and it's gotten popular um, with the quote-unquote free-spirited people, people who feel that um, gluten-free is a freer way of eating, a healthier way of eating. It's not as processed. Um, this has become much, much more popular. It's become, become popular with a lot of celebrities as well. Um, so more and more food options have come about. We've also seen it in a lot of restaurants where they're putting gluten-free uh, parts of the menu for those specific people who either are just on the diet because they feel that it's a better way of eating or for people who have celiac or gluten insensitivity. Um, depending on the complete macro intake and macros, carbs, fats, proteins, there could have some effect on weight loss. If you're just consuming less, you will see weight loss over time. If you are consuming uh, a better ratio of macronutrients, you could see potential weight loss depending on exercise, intensity, resting metabolic rate, all those things. It allows people to feel they are potentially eating healthier again. It kind of gives them that sense of they're doing something better for their body. And again, a more whole food based. And there has been some anecdotal research and observational research that it could potentially prevent um, onset or control at least diabetes. And again, that should make sense, especially the control of diabetes, because a lot of the foods that, are, that have gluten in them are heavy in carbohydrate. The wheats, the rice, the, the malts, the certain, certain barleys, the, you know, certain extracts that have gluten in them um, where they may be higher in carbohydrates. So people with type 1, type 2, um, they want to control that carb intake, which potentially means controlling that gluten intake. Um, what the gluten-free diet gets wrong, there may not be any other health benefits other than the treatment of celiac or gluten insensitivity. Uh, so for, for the people who say, well, it helps with this, helps with that, that may not be the case. It just may be the placebo effect or just the fact that you're eating different foods more nutrient-dense foods that are making you feel and look and perform better. Um, but do not get confused that gluten-free means also eating better. You're still able to get nutrient-weak foods, which are high-calorie, low nutrients, on a gluten-free diet. A lot of the fast food, a lot of the processed convenience store foods that we can get at gas stations, um, those are, a lot of them are gluten-free, high-in-calorie, high in fat, 
low in nutrients, and we can pig out on those all day long. And if we had celiac, be fine. But we are going to have very few nutrients. We're going to have a lot of calories. So we may be overfeeding ourselves, but we will be starving to death in nutrients. So do not mistake that you can eat poorly on a gluten-free diet. Um, there is a steep learning curve for beginners. So people who have just been diagnosed or people who want to start out eating gluten-free have to be aware that a large, large number of foods that we eat have gluten in them, contain gluten substances or derivatives, or have been processed in a place that has gluten. And for a lot of those people to say, oh, I can't eat this anymore, and I can't eat that, and I can't try this, and this has been processed with gluten, and this has been used, and there's been gluten here, um, that can just be mentally and physically exhausting to have to remove those foods and realize, now what can I eat? And with that, it's still very difficult today to get those foods and to avoid gluten altogether. There are people who are very severe reactors with celiac <clears throat> and gluten intolerances. And when I say severe, there are people that, you know, if you're at a restaurant and if they have a very, very severe condition with celiac, their food has to be processed with a different toaster, a different potential oven, a different knife, a different cutting board, a different sink, a different microwave, because any cross-contamination between foods, products, hardware, anything like that can bring gluten into that food, and that person can be can consume that food, even if just a little bit, and have a severe reaction. So people who are very have that celiac uh, affliction, and if it's a very severe one, a very sensitive one, there has to be a lot of care and precaution uh, for those people with that uh, insensitivity or, or that disease. And the last one, and some of you may be wondering, I don't even know what this is. I've never heard it. It sounds like some text message thing. We're going to go over this, and you're going to understand that some of you actually may be doing this right now. It's called If It Fits Your Macros. And I thought these pictures were funny. There's that baby, of course, that's always looking curious. And for those of you who don't know, that's part of the Napoleon Dynamite movie, which I find pretty funny myself. So, um, you know, the whole idea of counting your macros, again, proteins, fats, and carbs, this is the basis of this diet. So if you really break it down, if it fits your macros, is just a diet that you count your macronutrient needs. You just count proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, and once you meet them, you're good. And that's the very, very basic general idea of this diet. If you look at the chart on the right, you'll see it says My Fitness Pal. My Fitness Pal is essentially an IIFYM tracker. You plug in numbers that you need. You plug in like who you are, what you are, your level. You plug in you know where your total fat should be, or you know, sometimes it can tell you depending on which app you're using, and it'll tell you, okay, here's your total for this, here's your goal, here's what's left. And so you just plug in foods that meet those requirements, and you've done it. This is a pretty controversial eating plan right now. This is relatively newer. Uh, I'm sure it's been going on for years, but anytime somebody comes up with a very creative name, uh, it becomes a very new, great, um, ingenious idea. So more than likely, the if it fits your macros has been going around for a long time, but just recently it's become more and more popular, especially with the new apps and technology that are able to track them, because it's very easy to track. It's only three numbers, and you just plug away and add, subtract, and there you go. Um, you, it states that you can essentially eat whatever you want as long as it fills your allotment of the fats, carbs, and proteins. So they're basically saying with this diet, it really doesn't matter what you consume, as long as you are meeting those three requirements. So if your requirements are 50 grams of carbs, 50 grams of protein, 50 grams of fat for the day, and you plug in your food and it meets them, you've done it. So it didn't matter if you ate vegetables and lean meats and you know whole grains or if you ate processed foods and fatty meats, as long as it meant those three numbers, you should be good. But you have to be cognizant of the calorie intake as well, because 
if you're plugging in these numbers and it's not meeting up to your calorie intake or calorie needs, that energy balance, you're missing something. Um, so as in every dietary plan, especially as an RD, what we do, we just don't automatically say, oh, you want to lose weight, this is what you have to eat. You have to get these numbers first. You have to know the individual. If it fits your macros, unfortunately, again, doesn't do a lot of this. Like a lot of other diets, they don't. Um, you have to know your exercise energy expenditure. What are you burning? What are you utilizing when you're working out? What is your RMR, your resting metabolic rate? What is it just from existing? Sitting down in a chair, talking on the phone, just being there. Um, your thermic effect of food. When you chew food, when you eat food, when you digest it, when you process it, that all requires energy. <clears throat> all of that equals your total daily energy expenditure, your TDEE. What is your TDE with all of your exercise, your standing, your sitting, your resting metabolic rate, the food that you're eating? And what are your current eating patterns and ratios? Are you eating more carbs to fats? Are you eating more proteins to carbs? Are you eating more in the morning, more in the evening, spread out throughout the day? These things don't take these things into account. So we have to be cognizant of all those numbers, all those patterns, all those decisions, and then see if the IIFYM actually fits what we need. <clears throat> so here's just a quick thing about classic meal plan and the if it fits your macros meal plan. You can certainly see it later. I'm going to move through, um, but it's very, very basic. So what does the IIFYM get right? It's a, an extremely simplified eating pattern. It's basically saying eat what you want, make sure you fill these numbers, and once you reach these numbers, you're good. Whether there's not and if you found out those numbers, you should be able to reach your weight loss or weight gain or weight maintenance goals. It could potentially lead to the weight loss or gain, and depending on whatever that goal is. If you knew your daily energy expenditure, if you knew your exercise, if you knew your eating pattern, and if you knew your total daily energy expenditure and you whether subtracted for weight loss or um, increased for weight gain, it could potentially lead to those levels or those changes. Um, it does allow, out of the diets that we've talked about, the largest amount of freedom of food choices. It's pretty much saying, have what you want as long as it's within these boundaries. <clears throat> the, the increased feeling of enjoyment of being able to eat essentially what you want and having a lot less restrictions on timing and food consumption, amount, type, those kind of things. And a lot of these diets are now coming up with uh, apps where they can actually utilize these apps to track and, uh, any progress. And the If It Fits Your Macros, and especially with my fitness pal and other things, um, these are some of the first ones to really come out and be popularized, heavily popularized. What it gets wrong, this diet, if you're not really tracking it well, especially with today's apps and software, you may not be taken into your micronutrient account. Just because you're meeting your macronutrients, does not mean you're getting your micronutrients. And we don't necessarily think all the time, well, I, if I meet them, that's fine. If I don't, oh well. But those micronutrients are the basis for what we are and how we utilize those macronutrients. And we need to make sure we consume and ingest the right amount consistently. So the IIFYM diet may not take into account those levels. Um, there's no studies done to show any health benefit with the if it fits your macros, whether or not you have better blood pressure, worse, better insulin sensitivity, worse insulin, insulin sensitivity, <clears throat> um, decrease or increase disease morbidity is nothing. And everything that's been done that says it's helped with this has been anecdotal. Um, because there's so few barriers on this diet, the potential for overconsumption is there. A lot of people that I've spoken with, you know, if you're eating and you're plugging these in and you happen to be maybe three, four, five grams over your allotment, well, okay, no problem. You're only a few grams. But then you do it the next day and you do it the next day. And soon those small overconsumptions become large overconsumptions and we stop and we start seeing limitations on the progress we're making. And so, which gives us all that freedom gives us more freedom to kind of make poorer choices, unfortunately. And if you want more precise tracking, you have to use some of these apps or tracking tools, and those can be expensive for a lot of people. And some people who don't have smartphones um, or have utilization to computers uh, don't have the ability to track as well. So what does it all mean? 
really, if you were paying attention, you would hear that any diet that restricts a substantial amount of calories will cause weight loss. It's essentially Newton's laws of thermodynamics. We cannot deviate from Newton's laws. No human can. If you put in less to the system, you will lose out of the system. You will lose weight. There's not anybody who says, oh, they can't. You have to try it for a longer period of time. And we are also assuming a healthy individual with a longer period of time. People who have um, certain disease or metabolic issues, we are, of course, not considering that. Um, but any diet that restricts calorie intake compared to calorie necessity for total daily energy expenditure, there will be weight loss over a given period of time. And some people are more susceptible to greater weight loss within a few weeks. Other people need to see a few weeks or a few months to see that weight loss. Everybody's individualized. But just the notion that the restriction of calories in any diet will cause weight loss, it's a basic law. Um, healthy, nutrient-dense food choices with exercise, with the workouts that we do, um, walking, playing with our children, being at the gym, those healthy nutrient-dense foods with that substantial calorie restriction will have the greatest impact on body composition and goal reaching. That is unquestionably true. Many of today's diets, as you can see, have limitations. And those limitations can have drastic effects on how we perceive these diets. The restricted food choices, taking things that we dearly love every day and want to have every day. Poor micro and macronutrient consumption, regulation and tracking in some of these diets. They can be expensive, hard to come by for some people, especially in lower SES areas or people who live further away from heavily centralized areas. Um, unfortunately, there's little data and scientific research on the efficacy and effectiveness on these diets. Um, many only promote the short-term results. So when you're looking around and somebody says, oh, I lost weight, well, have you maintained that weight loss? Are you healthier consistently in the few years that you've been off it? We don't know those answers for a lot of these people because we see a lot of the short-term effects. We have to see the long-term effects. And little research on the increased health benefits of some of these diets. So all these diets in consideration with a healthy individual with a long given amount of time consistently performing and eating, maybe not the same foods, but consistently eating a restricted calorie level, you will always see a weight loss. So for those of you who want to see which diet is the best, here is the answer. And I hope you're not disappointed in this. Every diet's the best and no diet's the best. I'm sure some of you could probably have come to that decision by now, but the diet that is going to be the best is going to be the diet that is best for you that you can continue doing over a long period of time. The greatest detriment to a diet not working is somebody does not continue it for a long period of time and maintain consistency with it. That is absolutely true. Most people will start a diet reduce calories, not see results, or see results and then stop seeing results, stop the diet, try to do something else. Now the body has to catch up on doing that new thing. Maintaining that consistent eating pattern, whether it's reduced calories or increased calories, depending on whatever goal we're going for, over a long period of time, maintaining those workouts, maintaining that consistent intake and utilization we will see the weight loss that we want. For some people, it's going to be a shorter time. For other people, it's going to be longer. But it will happen given the time and given the consistency. The diet is best for you that meets the essential level of nutrients, the nutrient-dense foods to fuel your body and cells. Whatever that diet is, if you can get those nutrients in, if you, if you have to take a multivitamin or a single mineral vitamin uh, to make sure you are meeting those necessary levels. Um, the perfect diet is the one that controls energy balance. Even during exercise periods, the energy balance doesn't mean whatever I put in, I have to, whatever I work out, I have to put back in. That just means if I'm going to 
want to be in a calorie deficit, I have to make sure I maintain that deficit evenly for days, for weeks, for months. Because those extreme fluctuations of over-consuming, um, supra-under-consuming changes our body composition, changes how our body affects. So again, it all comes down to consistency, long-term consistency. The best diet for you is going to be one that's outcome-based. If you can set a specific goal for yourself, you want to have this type of waistline, you want to be at this percent fat, you want to have this level of health, you want to be able to perform at this 5K or be able to do as many push-ups or squats, these, whatever diet you pick will have a specific goal and is outcome-based. We'll be able to say, I'm able to see these results because of this diet, I'm able to maintain it, I'm able to utilize it, I'm happy with it, and I'm seeing the results that I want over a course of time. And the best diet for you is going to be the one that's sustainable. Financially sustainable, can you maintain this diet without breaking the bank and losing funds over this? Is this diet sustainable geographically? Do you have to travel 9, 10, 12 miles to a grocery store to get these foods? Or can you walk down the street to grab everything? Um, everybody's different. Everybody lives in different areas. Is it easily accessible to you? Is this socially sustainable? A lot of us have um, extreme social lives. We're able to go out with many friends many multiple times or have events with a lot of people that may not give us access to the foods that we necessarily want to consume but have to consume for the social norm or the place that we're at. Can you maintain this diet in a socially acceptable place with the people that surround you, your family, your friends, your immediate group of people that support you. And personally, can you personally adhere to this diet and say, I want this, this is good for me, it balances everything I need, I'm able to sustain this across the whole spectrum, and this is what I feel is best for me right now. That is the diet that works for you. So for some of you, some of these four, these four diets may not work. For others, any four of these diets may work. But it's these main points that you have to take away from each of these diet plans and any diet plan. Can, is it sustainable? Can you last a long time with it? Can you do it over a period of time with exercise and not have any deleterious effects? Reduced performance, poor sleep patterns, moodiness. Are you meeting the essential levels of the nutrients that are necessary? Are you controlling the energy that you need throughout the day to continue? and will lead to that specific goal that you're looking for. And once you reach that goal, what's next? What changes? What are you going to do to reach that other goal that you want, that body composition, that performance, and that good health role looking for? So that's it. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, for those of you, if you have any questions, please, again, don't hesitate to send them in. This will be available for you to all look at. Uh, if you do have any questions um, that maybe we didn't get a chance to answer, please don't hesitate to send them in, and I'll be glad to answer them at a later time and have them posted for you all to look at. I hope you all have a good evening, and I look forward to talking to you again in the next month. Take care.